New Mexico's public TV stations, KNME, KRWG, and KENW, are proud to present the 2018 New Mexico Senate Candidate Conversations. Recorded in the KNME studios in Albuquerque and featuring all three of the major party candidates, Democrat Martin Heinrich, Libertarian Gary Johnson, and Republican Mick Rich. Welcome to this election 2018 special. I'm Gene Grant of New Mexico PBS. We're proud to partner once again with not only the other two New Mexico PBS stations, KENW and KRWG, but also NPR radio stations KUNM and KANW. Our goal is simple, to help inform you, the voters, before you cast your ballot in this year's midterm elections. Today, we sit down with the three candidates for U.S. Senate. Martin Heinrich is the junior senator from New Mexico and served two terms in the House before that. He is challenged this year by Republican Mick Rich and another familiar name here in New Mexico, former Governor Gary Johnson, who stepped in as the Libertarian candidate when Aubrey Dunn backed out earlier this fall. I sat down recently with all three to talk about their goals and priorities. We'll start first in random order with the latecomer to the race, Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson, welcome. Thanks for coming in the studio. Good to see you. Gene, great to see you, and thanks. Been a while. Been a while. Now you're running for... Senate? U.S. Senate. Complete so surprise. That's right. right. I mean, really? Well, I want, I want to get to the surprise element, but t a couple of years ago you ran for president. You said afterwards you weren't going to run for political no office. No way was I going to run for politi political office yeah. anymore. And if you've ever heard me answer the question of why don't you run for the U.S. Senate, I've said, look, it's a job that's all about bellying up to the trough, and the last thing we need is more spending. Mm -hmm. Well, what's at stake here potentially is the swing vote in the U.S. Senate, mm. which would be huge influence for New Mexico. And my number one issue is spending. My number one issue is the deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have, a, we're gonna spend a trillion dollars this year, more than what we're gonna take in. Look, if spending money that you don't have were the key to a country's success, mm -hmm. Zimbabwe would be the world capital, <laughs> followed by Venezuela. Right. But it doesn't work. And everybody's got their heads in the sand in Washington over, in this case, reform of Social Security, reform of Medicaid, reform of Medicare, mm -hmm. our military interventions and a cut in the military. Mm -hmm. um, you can't balance the federal budget if you're not going to address those issues. Mm -hmm. Let me bring it a little closer to home. I hear that point. I want to circle back to a couple of those things. But economic development here in New Mexico, as you know, is a big issue. You've been part of that as yes, governor, certainly, yes. and as your own company, you're part of that as well. What's your, what's your priorities for economic development, and what can you do as a senator for New Mexico? <clears throat> well, having been, uh, having been a candidate for president twice, uh, I've been around the whole country. I know what works and what doesn't work. And what works is a low-tax, low-regulatory environment. And I do think that I provided that as governor of New Mexico. You know, when I, when I ran for president in 2012, they did an analysis of who had the best record on jobs of all the presidential candidates. Well, it was me. Mm. And my response to that was, you know what? I didn't create a single job in New Mexico. The private sector creates jobs. But I think I contributed mightily to a regulatory environment that really kind of leveled the playing field for everybody. And when you level the playing field for everybody, those are the results. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it just about taxes, though, and regulations for here in New Mexico? I mean, we're a little behind, you know, to be fair about it. Is there something more needed for economic development besides just low tax? Oh, yeah. Well, in New Mexico, you know, we, we may have more uh, occupational um, um, barriers put in our way than any other state. Mm -hmm. You got to be licensed to cut hair in New Mexico. Well, that takes time for the hair cutter. That costs money for the hair cutter. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to belittle this in any way, but look, a bad haircut's a bad haircut. Why should there be any licensing at all with regard to this? I look at an Uber model for everything. Let's, let's look at the Uber model. You have somebody to come pick you up you're paying less for the ride than you've ever paid before, and the person doing the driving is making more money than they've ever made before. So how about Uber electrician, Uber plumber, Uber doctor, Uber accountant, eliminating the middleman, allowing for you and I as consumers to pay directly to the person providing the service. Elimination of the middleman. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of federal legislation that could come to play on being able to create um, uh, being able to, uh, to, to, to take your trade and ply it. Mm -hmm. 
that's the gig economy is that you're describing basically we're all, all a bunch of freelancers now and just we can a bunch of freelancers which which but, is but what do we... but do workers get protection under that under that scheme or? well sure you well that's where the federal legislation could come in by by protection right now we we're so ensconced in this protection and health care to the point where your your trade is not portable you you mm. can't take it you can't pursue um better reward. You can't pursue more money because it's taken so much time to land the job that you currently have. And that goes for employers also. Mm -hmm. That could be made easier on both sides. Portability. Right. Fair enough. Uh, healthcare. Let me move on to another one. About half of our citizens here in New Mexico are under some kind of federal scheme, Medicare, or Medicaid, for their health care. Would you be... Uh, would you see a way to expand that? Is that good for New Mexico? Oh, it's not, it's not good for New Mexico. When you, when you tax something, when you tax anything, you get less of it. When you subsidize whatever it is you subsidize, you get more of it. Mm -hmm. So if we're subsidizing people to not work, what are we going to end up getting? You know, when I was governor, um, we implemented welfare reform in New Mexico. And very simply, mm -hmm. if you were making $100 on welfare, how about the government cutting back that to $75 and then allowing you to go out and make $75. So instead of making $100, you made $150 with the government paying less, but you being able to go out and make more and not get penalized because if you make a penny more than $100, then you don't receive any government assistance at all. So well, what happens if your extra $50 has to go to health care? It has to, has to pay for something that... Well, in, in the case of health care, what's really needed when it comes to health care is a free market approach to health care. Okay. And we are about as far removed from free market as we possibly could be with regard to health care. But if there were a free market for health care, you and I would have insurance to cover ourselves for catastrophic injury and illness, and we would pay as you go in a system that would be incredibly affordable. You'd be able to pay cash for your medical service. The government could establish health savings accounts that we could use to pay that cash. If there were a free market approach to health care, we would have gallbladders are us. We would have clinics that would specialize in gallbladder surgery sure. for thousands of dollars as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars. But when you think about the internet and being able to contact your doctor or uh, to, to get medical advice and p possibly pay $35 for that fee as opposed to sitting in a doctor's office all afternoon having no idea what you're going to end up paying for it because you're not going to pay for it, insurance does, mm -hmm. and, and those that are there in the doctor's office don't even know what you're going to get charged. Well, that's the system that we have today, and it's broken. Would, I, would that include what we're calling Obamacare right now, when, if, if and when? You, you win this race, if you win this race, what would be your approach to Obamacare? Well, Obamacare is the Affordable Health Care Act. Mm -hmm. And let me just start off with, is health care affordable today in any way, shape, or form? It's not. Right, right. I hear you. Uh, opiate addiction. Um, Marijuana. Gee, <laughs> that'll, 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 that'll no, 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 go no. a long way. Right. Go ahead. Well, we, we, we can talk about marijuana separately, but opiate addiction and opioids uh, clearly has been an issue since you left office yes. here. Yes. It's grown across the country as well as here in New Mexico. What, as senator, would you be able to do to help stem the tide? of opiate addiction. Make marijuana more available. So three issues regarding marijuana, and I really genuinely believe mm -hmm. that marijuana would positively impact the opioid crisis in a way that the opioid crisis would actually go away if, mm -hmm. if everyone had access to marijuana. But there are three, uh, three things federally that I think need to get done with regard to marijuana. Mm -hmm. Uh, one would be to deschedule it as a class one narcotic, allowing for research, allowing for the banking issues to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, another is drug testing. Um, right now, you test positive for marijuana even though you're not impaired. Government needs to establish impairment. Right now, there are thousands of people losing their jobs because they test positively for marijuana mm -hmm. when in fact... Um, they're not under the influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there needs to be a pardoning process in place for those who have been, who are convicted felons today because of marijuana laws right. uh, that, but for those marijuana laws, they would otherwise be tax paying law abiding citizens. But like I say, today they are 
convicted felons. Would you support the Cory Booker or Elizabeth Warren bill that's looking to exonerate folks that have had marijuana convictions absolutely. as a federal? Abs absolutely, right. yes. Okay. And I would, I would be uh, in a triumvirate there. Um, right. I, I would join hands on that one. I'd be shouting, look, I, I'm not intending to be a wallflower if elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, mm -hmm. My um, my pledge is, is to submit a balanced budget to Congress. I would hope to be on the Senate Budget Committee uh, and address the issues that everyone seems to have their heads in the sand over. Immigration. Um, I'm curious where you are on this. You are two-term governor of a border state. Do you support the issue as it's being played out now in Washington with less folks being able to come in? Or no, would you support no. Immigration is, is a wonderful thing. We're a country of immigrants. Let's not build a wall, mm -hmm. but let's make it as easy as possible for somebody that wants to come into this country and work to be able to get a work visa. And a work visa should entail a background check and a social security card that taxes get paid. Right. Look, border security is something that is important, doesn't involve a wall, but we don't want truckloads of convicts coming across the border. We don't want drugs coming across the border. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, building a wall uh, and vilifying, and as a border governor, understanding that the number one factor for an illegal immigrant is someone that came over a different time uh, on a work visa that expired. Well, it was a different time. Work visa expires. That individual is working, continues to work, pay taxes, raises a family, and now that individual is going to be deported back to, back to Mexico mm -hmm. or wherever? That's not fair. Do you support amnesty for folks that have been here and working and you know, paying taxes? Well, of if you want to use the word amnesty, mm -hmm. but there needs to be a pathway to citizenship that's established. Mm -hmm. But that should include those individuals that have been here for a certain amount of time, have been law abiding, have paid taxes, have raised families. That needs to be in conjunction with a pathway to citizenship. Make sure I'm clear. I'm talking something expanded beyond DACA, beyond minor children, I'm talking adults. Still same theory? Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting. Um, Do let's handle DACA specifically, though. I don't want to let that wriggle away. Have we mishandled DACA? It, it, was President Obama on the right track on this? Yes, he was. Okay. Yeah, he was. But, mm -hmm. but uh, look, these kids didn't have a choice. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they deserve uh, t to receive an education and they deserve to remain in this country. What should be done with the kids that are un right now under detention? Oh my gosh. And, and what, what do we have, 12,000 kids now in detention? Yeah. That needs to be, it shouldn't have ever happened in the first place. Now, what this also pushes forward is the obvious need to codify all of this in legislation. Mm -hmm. Well, as a border state governor, I should be able to lead the charge on this mm -hmm. and would intend to do so. Mm -hmm. Climate change. Um, I know where you've been in the past on this, but I'm curious where you are now. Man-made, still man-made, you still in agreement with that? Oh, and if I, so, or where, where should we, what should we be doing to limit climate well, for, problems? Well, first now? of all, one of the best, ex I, I am just uh, excited about renewable energy, mm -hmm. right? Cleaning up the fact that coal has been bankrupted by the free market system. Coal has been bankrupted um, because of uh, natural gas, because of fracking, because natural gas costs less than coal. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, the coal plants that are burning uh, are going to wear out at some point, and they're not going to be replaced with coal they're going to be replaced with natural gas. Now, looking forward to 2040, 2050, where maybe half the grid might be from renewable energy, that's exciting. But mm -hmm. the other half is going to come from uh, natural gas. Mm -hmm. And the issue surrounding uh, uh, renewables right now is storage. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be some technological breakthroughs that I do believe will occur. When, when is it going to be that moment, though, when renewables can compete in the open market that you like to talk about? Well, I think, uh, I think is it now? Is it, it oh, far in the future? It, okay. Yeah, no, it is now. But but okay. the but the real wh what you're talking about, the real competition, the real going to having it a bigger portion right. of the grid is right. storage. Okay, and and that's the issue. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I want to talk about student debt. This has come up a lot in our studio. It's a very interesting thing. There's a movement out there to have a scheme 
where one can work off their student debt, a forgiveness program. Uh, would you support an idea like that yeah, as a, I think, as a I senator? Yeah, I think students, students have been sold a bill of goods. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I maintain that the reason for high, the high cost of college tuition mm -hmm. has everything to do with guaranteed government student loans. Mm -hmm. If guaranteed government student loans were to have never existed, I suggest to you that college tuition across the board, across the country, would be half of what it is today. Mm. But because you are guaranteed a government student loan, colleges and universities have been immune to the efficiencies that, uh, that ordinary business would be subje uh, subjected to. Mm -hmm. Guns in schools, big topic for us here and across the country and here in New Mexico. Simple first question about Second Amendment, Amendment rights. Who should be allowed to carry guns in our society? Well, uh, the big issue surrounding guns, and I'm just as concerned as anybody else, is how do you keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill? Gene, I haven't heard a suggestion on how that might occur, but I'm open to that debate and that discussion on how that might occur. I'm just afraid that the arbiter ends up being the government, and if I go to apply to buy a gun, that I, I personally might be denied um, access to owning that gun for whatever reason mm -hmm. that I've come up against the government arbiter. Does that include assault rifles in your view? Well, assault rifles uh, are automatic rifles yeah. and there are 50 million automatic rifles in this country. So assault rifles are semi-automatic rifles. That's what they are. And if you ban semi-automatic rifles, I think you're going to have an entirely new class of felons of otherwise law-abiding, tax-paying citizens that aren't going to turn in their guns. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm supporter of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. As Senator, talk to me about um, your attitude and your ideas about working with local folks, meaning Mayor Keller, whoever the governor is going to be, the teams, so to speak. It's an important well, part of New has Mexico. That has to be part of the equation. This is a team effort, and yeah. it's on behalf of New Mexico, as it should be. Right. Uh, and I look forward to that. Uh, you know, I just came from the uh, tribal council meeting, and I think uh, tribes and pueblos in New Mexico have this incredible opportunity because they are sovereign nations. Having been governor, I understand that. Having worked through the compacts and having looked at a number of issues where the tribes and pueblos can actually address huge issues in this country that we're not, we're not addressing ourselves, but mm -hmm. they have the opportunity to do that for themselves and for the nation and make a lot of money doing it. Mm -hmm. Last question. A lot of folks are sort of questioning why you're in this race in the first place. You've done some things in government. You've had some success. What does public service mean to you, and what do you want to accomplish here as Senator? Well, a lot is at stake. Uh, if a Democrat is elected, if a Republican's elected, you're not talking about the swing vote. If an independent libertarian is elected, why, arguably, that would be the swing vote. And I really believe the biggest issue facing this country is our deficit, mm -hmm. is the fact that we're printing money, a trillion dollars this year. It's incredibly unfair to our grandkids, to our grandkids' grandkids. We're not going to survive this. And how are we not going to survive this? There, at some point, is going to be horrible inflation that will accompany, right now, what is a $21 trillion national debt. Mm -hmm. Last question, just need a quicker answer on this. Can you win this? Can you honestly win this, do you think? Well, I wouldn't be doing it if that weren't the case. Okay. Okay. Gary Johnson, governor, ex-governor of New Mexico, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and coming in. Good luck thank on the you. trail. Thank you. Absolutely. Next up, we hear from Republican candidate Mick Rich. Rich owns Mick Rich Contractors and is also a member of the State Labor Industrial Commission. I had the chance to catch up with him earlier this week to talk about his priorities and why he wants to represent New Mexico in the U.S. Senate. Mick Rich, thanks for coming in. Really appreciate it. Gene, great to be here this afternoon. Absolutely. First question, um, what's the one thing our state urgently needs that you would supply as being a member of Congress? Man, good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I was up in Las Vegas here a couple months ago. Uh, believe it or not, for your viewers, there I am. I walk into a hair salon, uh, chat with the folks there, and, and she said, we've lost 4,500 people in Las Vegas wow. since 2000. 5,000 people are looking for work. In Las Vegas has only 15,000 people. 
in the in the storefronts are boarded up. Mm -hmm. It's jobs across the board, but also University of New Mexico. Look at the graduates. Are they staying here or are they leaving the state for good paying jobs, right? That's what I'm going to concentrate on. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, dovetailing off of that, do you have priorities for economic development here? Are there specific issue areas that you see that have opportunity for New Mexico? Well, I do. There are several of them. Number one is to make sure that our labs and bases are having a solid mission and that mission is, is funded. And right now, other states are picking off our missions from our labs and bases. Prime example is our Air National Guard has no airplanes. We are the only state in the Union with an Air National Guard with no airplanes. If we don't get a new mission for them, it's lost. But at Kirtland, at Holloman, and also at Los Alamos, mm -hmm. that's number one. I served on the board for Albuquerque Economic Development for a number of years. And I asked Gary, I said, what would you want from your U.S. Senator? And he said, Mick, what we want is for you to be an ambassador for our state, for the people in New Mexico when you travel the country say New Mexico's got great people and they're ready to go to work. Mm -hmm. They're committed to their families and to their communities and you can't get a better workforce than New Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you another, another on that topic, we ask a lot of the candidates that come in, it's one thing in our major metropolises like Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Farmington, Cruces, but remote work is a difficulty here. And rem working remotely, maybe it's better said, has been a right. topic of conversation. Your, th your thoughts on that? Is that an opportunity for our state it in is rural a, parts of our state? It is a huge opportunity. And my construction company spent half uh, our time outside Albuquerque. So I've worked all over northern New Mexico for 35 years. So like in, we go back to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. It's allowing the people of Las Vegas and up through Mora and all the communities up through there that to get back to their roots where they were making a living while being good stewards of the federal lands and supporting their families. And the regulations, wilderness, monuments, have meant that those individuals can't be making a living. And for your viewers, for they know this, look at what Christmas time's around the corner. A lot of the Christmas trees come from Mora. Ah, right. And those people, that's how they make a living. Same thing with firewood. Mm -hmm. And you can't haul firewood five miles to your truck right. to bring it to Albuquerque to sell. Mm -hmm. So it's opening up our federal lands for multi-use. And then the other ones like in Roswell is that they have a burgeoning uh, aerospace industry to let other, peop other countries, not other countries, but companies know mm -hmm. around the country is that Los Alamos has got, uh, Roswell's got a great workforce. Mm -hmm. Where does broadband fit into your thoughts on this uh, for working remotely for rural parts of our state? You know, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and it is. But I don't think that broadband is the, you know, we get broadband in there and then immediately everybody's going to flock. Mm -hmm. But also some of the other things to look at is that New Mexico has such a rich tradition for uh, the arts. And when I came here almost 40 years ago, it was just Santa Fe and, and Taos. Mm -hmm. Now it's all over our state. So one of the ways to do it is to make sure that the people that come here for the arts go out into rural New Mexico, visit the artists, visit the communities, and in doing so, let them fall in love with our state just like I have and you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the things, but also it is that creative spirit that we have in our state that isn't there in other places right. that we need to really leverage on, and that's throughout our state. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about health care. As you know, about half of the Mexicans are on some kind of federal scheme for health care, Medicare, Medicaid. Would you support expanding Medicaid specifically? Would you support expanding these programs to help New Mexicans, or what's your, what's your point of view on these? First of all, I, I have always been committed to health care. And when I say that is, I've been an advocate that we need to reform the health care system, and I've done that for 25 years. I've provided health benefits for our employees. So mm -hmm. I understand firsthand how important affordable, accessible, high-quality health care is. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two is pre-existing conditions. That is huge. My family faced that when my wife was pregnant with our youngest daughter. It became a complicated pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And at one point we were looking at worst case scenario was financial ruin and lo losing our business. Wow. 
So I understand that, but where I believe that we need to go is, number one is good paying jobs that offer health care benefits. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, to make sure that we have uh, allow individuals to pick the health care benefits, that plans that they want, mm -hmm. and to be it by insurance across state lines. Mm -hmm. Medicaid expansion, there's going to be a vote potentially coming up in our legislature about this. Do you, do you support that here in New Mexico? Medicaid yeah. expansion is here. Okay. And it, as time progresses, it's going to be a financial burden on the state. The program is a burden, not the people. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is when we think about Medicaid, it's based on the poverty level. That is a direct result of a lack of jobs, good paying jobs. What we need to do mm -hmm. is get people so there's good paying jobs. People don't want to be on unemployment. People don't want to be on welfare. They don't want to be on Medicaid. They want to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And they want to be able to have good health care, private health care. And so we need to make sure we have those jobs. Mm -hmm. And that will decrease the cost of the state. And that's what we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. Opiate addiction, big problem nationwide, as you know. But here in New Mexico, in northern New Mexico, any part of the state, here in the, in the, in the urban center in Albuquerque, right. your idea on, on opiate addiction, what do we need to do to help solve this problem? It's, a, it's, a, it's an epidemic, and we all talk about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not at one time when I came here, it was just in a couple areas of the state. Mm -hmm. But I've, one of my daughter's close friend died of a heroin overdose, went to his funeral. Yeah. You know, I remember talking to his mom. It, it, it's devastating. And I've known other people that lost their children. So this is a problem. Mm -hmm. First of all is that 90% of the heroin, fentanyl, and uh, methamphetamines is coming across our southern border. The border needs to be secured. Mm -hmm. Number two is we need enforcement, and that's DEA. They need to step up. I talked to a sheriff in Española. He said that they did a drug bust, six pounds of heroin. The uh, individual that, uh, that they arrested was given time served, mm -hmm. kept his money, kept his car, kept his property. Wow. Uh, meanwhile, people are dying. These are the, indi these are the dealers of death. And this individual got off. We need to have more stringent penalties. Mm -hmm. You mentioned border uh, just now, and uh, leading into a, my next question, actually, <laughs> about immigration and uh, restrictions. Do you support the restrictions on uh, immigration that's happening right now in this administration? And if not, why? If so, why? So, what do you, I, I'm not. Could you define? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I hear your point. The idea that we should throttle, at the least, throttling back on who can come into our country through our southern border now. Do you okay. support that? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I I'm, look at this is, first and center is, we need to secure the border. Some places that's a wall, barrier, but whatever it is, we need to make sure that when people come to our country, they're coming through our border crossings, not through open borders. Mm -hmm. I was down on the border, talked to ranchers, they're talking about the drug runners coming through. Mm -hmm. So we need to secure the border. Number two is, it needs to be very clear that if you're not a U.S. citizen, you're legal, you're here legally or illegally, you're not a responsible member of the community, you're breaking our laws, not obeying our laws, you can't stay here, you need to go home. Mm -hmm. That's plain and simple. Those are the rules that we should, you know, other countries govern by, we should do the same. And then lastly is that for those individuals, DACA, that are here that not by their own choice, mm -hmm. that came with their family, that we need to establish the date. And for those individuals, they get to stay here. There's a path forward. But they need to get in back of the line with other immigrants that I've talked to that have worked through the system. And they go, I worked through the system. There's no re it was well worth it to me. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about climate change. Um, Controversial, as you know, but however, we are in the ground zero for drought here in New Mexico, so it is a subject oh, for us. Yeah, absolutely huge. Huge. We've had rivers dropping, we've had watersheds dropping, we've had uh, lots of things happening with water here. Your, your, just first of all, your opinion on climate change is it man made, is it not man made, in your opinion, and what do we do about it? Gene, Second, it is the climate is changing, yeah. no doubt about it. Uh, humans have impacted the, the 
changing climate, mm -hmm. plain and simple. It's a complex issue. Uh, if I thought that if we all of a sudden just shut down everything that created greenhouse gases in New Mexico, mm -hmm. and I thought that would stop the climate from changing, I'd be for it. Right. But that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. The climate's going to continue to change. So how do we go about it? Mm -hmm. uh, we need to do it in a very uh, responsible manner, and we need to look at it. For prime example, as we're hearing that wind turbine, turbines generation, mm -hmm. great way to generate electricity. And now I read a report where it may also be contributing to heating up the environment. Mm -hmm. So we need to stop and take a look at just how we do things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a responsible manner. Mm -hmm. Another subject that we're talking about here at uh, New Mexico PBS quite a bit, and also with the candidates, is student loan debt forgiveness. This has been a big issue that's been bubbling under the surface for quite a number of years, as you might know. I'm curious your thoughts on that. <laughs> I love, uh, yeah. so, you know, four kids in college, I'm, I'm curious what yeah. you're, you know. Yeah. Oh, Gene, it, we've had numerous conversations. Now, right. we were, our children were fortunate. We helped them through college, but they, they worked their way through college. Right. Uh, my one daughter ended up having a scholar, uh, uh, athletic scholarship. The other one had athletic and, and scholastic. Mm -hmm. uh, but my two daughters, the one that's a PA now, a med student, and my other one, the P, uh, physical therapist, that they're hundred grand, hundred and fifty thousand. Wow. Yep. And the part that amazed me was that they are federally guaranteed loans, and they are seven eight percent. I'm going, they're federally guaranteed and they're not down what my mortgage is, that's not right. Yeah. So the interest rates need to be adjusted if they're federally guaranteed. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two is I do believe that the universities, colleges should inform their incoming students saying, if this is the major you're picking, right. this is what you can expect on what it's going to cost you to get through college, mm -hmm. and this is what you can expect for a job in your field. Mm -hmm. And are you okay with very an, an inability to pay back the loans? Right. And, and I'm a real advocate for vocational training, sure. education and training. I helped start one of the first vocational charter high schools in New Mexico, as well as uh, a multitude of uh, uh, building trades apprenticeship programs. So not everybody should be going to college right. to aspire to that. Some want to go the building trades. I always gave my children that opportunity. Mm -hmm. As an ex-contractor, that gets my attention, you know, getting kids off the right track, you know, in the yeah. building trades. Got a couple minutes left here. A uh, couple last questions. Got to talk about violence in schools and guns. A lot of controversy, of course, this past couple of years. We've had some tragedies, of course, here in New Mexico as well. Who should have a gun, first of all, and then second of all, your, your thoughts on, about violence in schools? How do we reduce gun violence? Gene, my heart goes out to those parents that say goodbye to their kids in the morning, fully expecting to see them come home in the afternoon, and they don't. I can't imagine losing your son or daughter. My heart goes out to them. Uh, first of all, th we have the Second Amendment. That is a right for all Americans. Mm -hmm. If someone's going to lose their Second Amendment rights, they need to have due process. Uh, my oldest daughter, uh, uh, when she was her last year in college, had a stalker. Oh, wow. We went to court and had an injunction. So, well aware of what this means, right. but if an individual. So, that's why it's important to have background checks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, those things are important. Mm -hmm. Do you find, do you support the idea of hardening schools? That's a term out there now, but having oh, someone armed in a school uh, pro, uh, setting? Oh, God, I, God, that tears me up to yeah. hear hardened schools. I mean, that, that doesn't, go, doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. uh, we've worked on so many schools. So I do think it's important that they have a, a secured border. So uh, anybody coming into the schools have that. And then mm -hmm. lastly, that, I think it's important that we're going to have to have, I hate to say it, mm -hmm. but personnel there that are armed. Right. If that's what it's going to take to keep our children safe. Mm -hmm. 
Coming a little bit closer to home as well, um, how would you anticipate working with local leaders here if you're successful in your run? You know, Mayor Keller, others around the state, do you, do you have relationships established already or is, is there? You know, I've chatted with, uh, with the mayor. Yeah. I've chatted with other uh, Republicans and, and, de and Democrats across the state. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important that the senator has a great relationship. That if we go back to the history of what is, how senators were chosen, it was through the legislature, right. which meant that the senator had a solid relationship with the legislature. Mm -hmm. I believe that, that that needs to be followed through, even though it's elected by the citizens of New Mexico. But I have a good relationship with the legislature, mm -hmm. the governor, and the, uh, the leaders of the communities. Mm -hmm. We've got about 30 seconds left for your last question, and I ask this of all the candidates. What does public service mean to you? Why are you running? I'm, I'm, I'm curious what's in your heart to, to, to go out here. It's not an easy thing <laughs> to do, run for statewide office. Oh, in, it's in painful. It's unbelievable, <laughs> I can imagine. What, what does public service mean to you? I care about the people in New Mexico. Yeah. I, I have been given so much here. It tears me up to travel the state to see the shape our state is in. I, you know, I've had people say, can you help me? I'm worried I'm gonna lose my job. Or can you help me? My daughter is addicted to you know, put whatever in. Mm -hmm. Or the ranchers, I, I'm not safe here with the drug runners. It's that desire that I've got to make. I love our state, and we got to, right. we had, we've got such a great state, and we're struggling, and, and I want to make it better. I just so care so much for our state and the people. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm running. Mick Rich, thanks for coming in. Gene, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolutely. Lastly, we hear from the incumbent, Democrat Martin Heinrich, who was wrapping up his first term in the Senate after replacing Jeff Bingaman back in 2013. Before that, he served two terms in the House and a time as an Albuquerque city councilor. Senator Martin Heinrich, thanks for coming in. Really appreciate it. Great to be here. Absolutely. First question, just coming up at the end of your first term as a U.S. Senator. Just very curious, a lot of things can happen in the course of a term. What's your biggest accomplishment so far? You know, one of the things that I'm really proud of is the uh, the energy deal that we were able to cut at the end of 2015. Mm -hmm. um, a, a major energy policy bill had not passed for a long time, and we were able to simultaneously bring together the Republican and Democratic caucuses, extend the renewables incentives for both wind and solar, something that's really driving a lot of investment in New Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, allow market access to uh, to oil and gas uh, that it hadn't had before. It, it wasn't everything to everyone, but when you look at small towns in eastern New Mexico that are now seeing the, the investment from those wind tax credits in particular and what that's doing in terms of, uh, of rooftop and utility scale generation in the state, um, I'm, I'm really proud of what we were able to do there. And it, it's it's meant billions of dollars of investment in our state. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting on that point, there's a new era, of course, for technology when it comes to exploration, extraction, and all kinds of energy. Are we at poison a good place here in New Mexico to take advantage of some of that new technology? And oh, at, at, New Mexico is an energy state. And I think what we need to make sure we're always doing is looking to the future. Um, you know, Hydraulic fracturing was developed at Sandia National Laboratory. So they did a lot of the early research on that. Um, today, we need to be thinking about the fact that our energy landscape is changing. Uh, it's gonna become more and more, or I should say less and less carbon intensive. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure that the investment that flows with that comes to New Mexico as opposed to someplace else. Mm -hmm. So wind and solar are kind of at a tipping point now where they're cheaper than uh, traditional fossil sources for uh, for electrical generation in many cases, but we need to be thinking down the road about how much the energy system is gonna change even more as storage becomes the norm rather than the exception. Mm -hmm. That's growing gangbusters right now. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a responsibility, I certainly feel that on the energy committee to always be thinking about how do we maintain um, our position as a state that's always been ahead on the energy front. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about economic development. 
Uh, I like to say everyone's in the game. In, if you're in the delegation, you're working with the mayor, you're working with the governor. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, right? It's just a hand-in-hand -hand thing. But your biggest priorities for economic development here and the opportunity mm -hmm. you see, what's our opportunity for economic development when it comes from the Senate side of, of the world? I think we, we should always be looking to protect the things that we do so well for the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. So always reinvesting in things like our national laboratories that drive the science that then creates business opportunities across the country. Um, we've added about 3,500 jobs at our two national labs, in Sandia and Los Alamos, over the course of my, my first term. And we've also looked at how those those entities interact with small businesses in New Mexico, because that's really important. Mm -hmm. And the new management contracts, I'm very proud, are gonna have small business preferences for local businesses. Mm -hmm. Now that's good for local businesses because it helps you grow and maintain new businesses here. It's also really great for the labs because they build an ecosystem of support around them so that if they need something on a Sunday afternoon at four o'clock, they're not calling somebody in Kansas City, Missouri. They're calling somebody down the road who's going to really care enough to, uh, to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the issues we talk about here at New Mexico in Focus and here at KNME is this new idea of the remote worker. Mm -hmm. And when you think about our landscape, we're the fifth largest state in the union. Everybody can't be in Albuquerque or Santa Fe or Cruces or Farmington. No, or doesn't want to. Or doesn't want to, or even better said. Yeah. So how do we allow those folks as those remote workers to have access to more employers around the country, around the world? This, I think, is the, when you look at what happened in the 2016 election, I think part of that was just a, a frustration with the fact that we've come to have multiple, you know, two economies in this country. You have an economy on the coasts, uh, and in some cases uh, in, in urban centers, that is growing and seeing the benefits of what has been a long expansion. And then when you look to rural communities, because of the lack of investment of infrastructure, it, it hasn't been there. And the, the frustration that comes with that. And I think the answer is to make sure that we have fiber and, and broadband into every single community in our country, whether that's a, a chapter house on the Navajo Nation, whether that's a small community in the plains of eastern New Mexico, mm -hmm. the way you connect people to the parts of the economy that are growing and thriving is through digital technology. And then rural people are incredibly creative, uh, self-reliant. They will find the ways to use that infrastructure to do great new things that we haven't even thought of. Let me ask you a little bit more uh, on that topic, because it is interesting, it's important for us here. The idea that you know you could be effective as a senator in this issue, how, how can an, a senator affect change on this issue? Is it about broadband? How, what can one do from the Senate seat to affect more broadband here in our state? Is, is, is yeah. there deal-making possibilities with carriers, yeah. or it's, how does it's, that work? It's a number of different things. One of the things you, you can do is you can use the bully pulpit. And as the ranking member of the Joint Economic Committee, mm -hmm. I have been putting out information on the necessity of broadband that I have found uh, really resonating with people across the political spectrum. And then there are individual pieces of legislation. Uh, the Farm Bill, for example, actually has a big impact on broadband because USDA is one of the places where uh, rural areas uh, get to attract financing to close the last mile or the, the gaps in that system. Right. So there, there are a number of different places, and I think we really do need a, a, an overall effort to say we're going to do this for our country mm -hmm. because it's important for rural America to thrive, mm -hmm. but it's also important every time there's an opportunity to chip away at it to do that as well. Because mm -hmm. everyone has to come at the table, again, with all the transmission problems, the tribes, individual municipalities. It's complicated. It, it, very, very complicated. Let's move on to healthcare um, for a couple of questions. Nearly, ha as you know, nearly half of New Mexicans are on some kind of federally funded health program, Medicare, Medicare Medicaid. Medicaid. Right. Would you, ex 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 would you support expanding these programs for New Mexicans? And is expansion something that's viable in this Congress right now? It's probably not viable in this Congress. Mm -hmm. That said, I think it's important to articulate a goal. And I think in the richest country on earth, mm -hmm. we really have, uh, I think we should do a better job of saying 
everyone in our country ought to have health care. It's a basic human right. So how are we going to get there? And, you know, for me, it's important to articulate a goal and then find the most pragmatic ways to move towards that goal. Mm. Medicaid expansion was a powerful thing in this state. Uh, one, it, it made people start getting, uh, allowed them to get health care in a primary care situation instead of an emergency room situation. Mm -hmm. It also stabilized our rural hospitals. So whether, when you take a program that people really believe in and trust and expand it when you have the opportunity to expand it, whether it's Medicaid or Medicare, I think those are two of the programs that have the most trust with the American people. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Obamacare, and it's under siege, as you know, in this administration. Yeah, very it's, much it's is. A, it's a difficulty, but at the same time, premiums have arisen. There's anger out there. It's difficult. Is this just a period we just kind of have to work through for health care, or is this well, something we can take and just further on down the road and expand for more people? And again, can we do that in the Congress as it's shaped now? I would submit that right now, the reason why premiums are rising over the course of the last couple of years mm -hmm. and why we've seen some retrenchment in terms of uninsured rates going up has been the continual effort to undermine the system. Uh, if you put uncertainty into the system, rates go up. That's how insurance works. Mm -hmm. And that's what every insurance company will, will tell you if you ask. So when the president does things that, that are designed to undermine o Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, the result of that is higher premiums. Mm -hmm. I think we're at a place now where we're, you know, we're a long way into this and we're getting a sense of what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We need to take an approach that says, keep the things that are working, tweak the things that are not, um, stabilize the system. And there are bipartisan efforts to do reinsurance and other programs that would just stabilize the system so that we can hang on to the gains in coverage that we've made. Mm -hmm. Opiate addiction, it's a big issue across the country and Huge. certainly here in New Mexico. Huge. What's, your, what's your plan for that? We need a serious level of investment. Now we have passed some really good legislation in the Senate with regard to policy, trying to make the way we deal with addiction uh, update it to the science that we know today. But we need to put resources behind that. Uh, we were able to put over $3 billion in the, the last omnibus spending bill, but that is just a down payment. That is just getting started. And we need to do a lot more because treatment is the only way out of this situation, and it is an epidemic. I have had so many friends uh, and people I know through this job who have, who have lost loved ones uh, because of this addiction. Um, so it, in, it, it's not gonna go away. We have to meet it head on, and it means resources. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about immigration, a big subject, of course, for our state as a border state, but across the country we've got a new idea coming out of our Department of Justice and the White House, of course, about what should happen with immigration. But for you, how, what's, what's your comeback to all this and what can we expect if you, in fact, win re-election? What's, what's the issue here that we need to deal with with immigration? I think the model for how you deal with immigration, it's out there. We've done it before. It's the bipartisan bill that passed the, the Senate a few years ago with overwhelming numbers. It's the kind of effort we saw when Pete Domenici and Jeff Behman and George W. Bush put together a comprehensive immigration bill. What's not a model is using this as a dog whistle to motivate people, mm -hmm. using it as a, a political wedge to divide the American people. That is, is the thing that I worry most about in our discourse right now. And as a result of doing that, we can't get something done. I mean, we had a deal on the table that the, the President of the United States agreed to, mm -hmm. and then his aides rewound that after all of the congressional leaders left the White House. Mm -hmm. and, and the result of inaction is, is horrible human toll, right? I mean, we have, we have dreamers who want to contribute to this country who should be today on the path to citizenship. We have people coming here in, from terribly violent situations who are not immigrants, they are refugees, they are seeking asylum, who walked across the border legally at a port of entry and their family gets divided up and, and four-year-olds get separated from mothers or fathers. This is not the America that accepted my father as an immigrant 
fleeing from Germany in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. I think we can do a whole lot better mm -hmm. on that issue. Tough word, but the word out there, amnesty, is that a viable option at this point politically for the 11 million folks who are here undocumented or some version of that? Well, I think amnesty has become a dog whistle. Mm -hmm. We need to just roll up our sleeves and and separate people based on whether, if, if their only crime is their immigration status. Mm -hmm. Let's find a path forward for those folks to earn citizenship. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if someone is involved in violent crime, that's a whole different category. We have to be able to separate criminality from being an immigrant. And, and we have political leaders now conflating those two things. And it is deeply irresponsible for a state like us who actually is a border state, knows how to do these things and do them right. Uh, and you have folks who don't have a border who are driving a picture of border communities that is completely inaccurate. I mean, when you look at the crime rates from McAllen, Texas, through Las Cruces, New Mexico, all the way to San Diego, and you compare that to some of the places the most anti-immigration political leaders come from, we look pretty good. Mm -hmm. So let's get rid of the vitriolic politics of this and roll up our sleeves and actually fix our broken immigration system. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about gun violence in schools. Uh, we got a couple minutes left. I'm going to cut a couple of quick hit topics here. What can we do about gun violence in schools and, and, and what happens with our kids and with guns? Who should have a gun, first of all, in your view? You're a solid NRA, I'm sorry, solid Second Amendment supporter. Yeah, and I would. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. I apologize for that. But I will say mm -hmm. that the, the NRA has been incredibly unwilling to even come to the table. They have been irresponsible mm -hmm. in what has been a continuous wave of gun violence that we have to do something about. Right. And I have had friends and colleagues who have been both shot at and who have been shot. Mm -hmm. in these kinds of incidents. Mm -hmm. So we have to find the things that we can, we can do. Mm -hmm. Universal background checks, oh my gosh, this should be just a no-brainer, right, as a, as a place to start. Um, we also need to rein in the capacity of the most extreme firearms to do a lot of damage. So things like limits on magazine size or uh, an approach towards um, assault rifles that deals with the capacity and the functionality not the cosmetics of what things look like. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the places where I would start. Mm -hmm. The environment, we certainly have to talk about that. Oil and gas is important here. We're always trying to strike a balance in New Mexico between getting what we need to get for uh, energy needs, but also protecting the environment. What's your plan as a senator for New Mexico to be able to balance both of those things? Well, I'm one, I'm really proud of my record with regard to protecting the special places in New Mexico that drive our economy. And I think it's really important us, for us to remember that almost 100,000 people are dependent on the outdoor recreation economy in the state, dependent on our public lands. And so protecting special places like the Valles Caldera National Preserve, uh, putting that under the management of the Park Service, creating two new national monuments in Oregon Mountains Desert Peaks and Rio Grande del Norte, those are uh, things that I am very proud of from my first term in the United States Senate. Uh, we also have to recognize the, the importance of oil and gas to, to our economy and, and in particular to our state uh, revenue. Right. And I, I would argue that we need to start thinking about the future and diversifying that energy portfolio as quickly as we can because we don't know um, when the next bust is going to come. And with commodities, you know, my father was, worked for Anaconda Copper, my grandfather worked in the gold mines. Those are great jobs until they're gone, and they're usually gone like that. Mm -hmm. And so we need to do a better job, uh, both making sure that we're, we're creating the new jobs, and then also making sure that when we do do extraction or development, that we do it responsibly. Mm -hmm. So things like methane leaks should not be something we're arguing about. Colorado is a great example of a state that did a great job reining in methane emissions, and it was a net gain for the producers and for the state economically. Mm -hmm. We should follow that here. We've tried to follow that at the federal level only to have the, uh, the Trump administration pull the rug out from under us. Mm -hmm. Last question, and I'm, I'm really curious about this one. It's your first lap as senator. 
And I'm just, I'm just so curious what public service now means to you. Has it changed? Has it, is, has it become bigger to you in some ways now that you've had the experience of this first term? What does, that, what does public service mean to you in your heart these days? I think it's, it's the same, I, I try to approach it the same way I did when I was on the Albuquerque City Council. Yeah. It's about finding an opportunity to bring people together and get something done for the community as a whole. And that just goes back to the kind of family that, that I grew up in. And my parents instilled the sense that uh, we've been lucky uh, as a result of this country. We have certain privileges, so we have to make sure that we maintain that. Mm -hmm. And I think in this time of uncertain democracy, where we have a White House who's not just someone I disagree with on policy, but who's been hostile to the foundations of our democracy, to things that are supposed to outlast any of the cast of characters who come and go and get elected. The free press, an independent judiciary, independent law enforcement. It's more important to serve now than ever to make sure that those things are not eroded because that is the reason why we are the democracy that so many countries around the world have looked up to for 100 years. Mm -hmm. Senator Heinrich, thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Good luck on the trail. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. You got it. We appreciate you tuning in to hear from all three of the Senate candidates and hope these candidate conversations will help you make an informed choice at the polls this year. A reminder, we will be hosting candidate conversations with the 3rd Congressional District on October 18th at 7 p.m. You can also go to our website at NewMexicoPBS.org to watch our interviews with the candidates in the governor's race as well as our first Congressional District Forum. Lastly, a reminder that absentee and in-person early voting started on October 6th. Full countywide early voting begins October 20th. So thanks for watching. We'll see you at the polls.